Good morning again. It's good to see that there are other COVID survivors with us today. It was not fun, but but uh, we made it through. We are overcomers. All right, if you would please take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter 3. While you're doing that, uh, 2 Timothy tells us all Scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We need to prove ourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Paul tells Timothy that bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. And I decided to add an extra verse for us today. We're going to start looking at also. Peter says, but grow in or by the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. And you wonder, why did he put in and by? Well, that little preposition there, that little Greek preposition can mean in, as going into something, or by means of, depending on, on how it's being used. And I have become more and more and more and more convinced, as, as I believe Mike has, that what Peter is saying is that we grow by God's grace and we grow by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's how we grow as believers. And so Wednesday evening, uh, we just completed Jonah this past Wednesday. So this coming Wednesday, we're going to begin a study called, uh, I can't remember, just went right out of my head. No, wrong. Ha ha. I know, but I lied. Because cause I do that. I'm, I'm a liar. No. No, it's actually uh, uh, something along the lines. Did she put it in the bulletin? She was going to put it in the bulletin. Good grief. How? I mean, I was about to say it, and it just went right. Developing a biblical worldview. Thank you. Good grief. You say, well, but, but you were, said we are going to study how to study the Bible. Exactly. How do you build a biblical worldview without first knowing what the Bible says? So we're going to begin Wednesday night by studying or beginning a study on how to study the Bible for yourself. Okay. From there, we're going to build upon that into what does the Bible say about, and you fill in the blank, we're going to build a biblical worldview. So that's one of the reasons I put this second Peter passage in here. All right, so let's begin this morning by reading together from Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. <clears throat> Jesus says to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain, which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. So remember what you have received and, and heard, and keep it, and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. But you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes will thus be clothed in white garments, and, will not, and I will not erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Father, thank you for your word and pray, God, that we will hand, handle it correctly this hour. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Sardis is an interesting city. I uh, grew up most of my life. Uh, in Arkansas, as you know, uh, and after my father retired from the military, he moved around a few times until he finally landed in uh, a little town called Blyville, Arkansas, where Blyville Air Force Base was located. We actually lived in Gosnell, which is actually where the Air Force Base was. So why was it called Blyville Air Force Base? I have no idea, because it was in Gosnell, Arkansas. It was right across the street from my school. 
And the effects that this bustling, uh, to me it was a large Air Force base, I don't know com comparatively speaking, uh, but the impact it had on both the little town of Gosnell, Arkansas and the small town of Blyville, Arkansas was, was amazing with all the, the life on the base, uh, bustling uh, life and, and uh, all the shopping and retail and stuff that they did in Blyville and, and the little bit that was in Gosnell. That base really kept both of those cities vibrant little, I mean, there were small towns, but they were vibrant. A great place to grow up. I would not change it for the life of me. Well, I went off to college and uh, three or four years later, because it only took me seven and a half years to get a four-year degree. But anyway, um, several years later, the base closed down. And if you go back there today, there are a few little businesses, a few little things going on in the Air Force Base. But I've seen pictures since. I've been on the base a few times since it's closed, but not in the recent history. But you get pictures back from friends about what used to be compared to what it is now, and it's just, it's just dead. I mean, although there is some life there. There's some people who live in some of the houses and, and things like that. There are a couple of businesses or so, but it, for the most part, it's just dead. Well, that's the picture that we get with the church in Sardis. Sardis was an interesting city because at one time, you know what, I'm jumping way ahead of myself here. Let me do some reminding. You, you, we've been through this a bunch of times, but just as way of reminder, John wrote it around 95 AD from Patmos, having an encounter with Christ. It was written for the purpose of encouraging uh, the believers who were under persecution and assault from different venues uh, to uh, continue in faithfulness, and it's dealing with the consummation of all things in the return of Jesus Christ. And that's where we get our... our uh, purpose for writing, I believe, right here. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. We see the basic pattern, as always. There's the character of the author. There's the commendation, the condemnation, the correction, and the challenge. And you're going to find out that in this church, there is no commendation. This is one of the two churches where there's no con commendation for the congregation. All right, so these are the churches we've looked at already. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira. Each of them had their own issues except for, of course, Smyrna, which was the faithful church even in the midst of suffering. But today we see Sardis, the church of the walking dead, and that's exactly what we find. So here's Patmos again, and this is Sardis. So it, Sardis is, a, as I was saying, it was an interesting city. Uh, it's a modern city of Sart, Turkey today. Uh, on the left, what you see is a picture of where the Acropolis was, and that's where the king lived at one time. And you can see it's built on, the, on this steep uh, mountain slope. Uh, we'll get to why that's important in a moment. And what you see on the right then is actually a rebuilt gymnasium. This is, was this magnificent gymnasium that they had in Sardis, and this has actually been rebuilt. And so that's the main attraction if you were to go to the city of Sart today. It's around 60 miles east of Smyrna, and it was at one time this grand capital of the kingdom of Lydia. Um, and their king, uh, Croesus, had gained great riches. So this was an extremely wealthy city at one time under this king. Um, as a matter of fact, I, I have never heard this statement until recently, but Ray Steadman, a pastor that I sometimes listen to, was teaching on this and said that when he was younger, of course he's been dead for several years now, but when he was younger, he said people would use this as a statement to discuss how rich a person was. Well, he's as rich as Croesus. I've never heard that. Maybe you have, but, uh, you know, we say things more like he's as rich as Midas or, or you know, um, Bill Gates or something like that. But anyway, that was because this man apparently just was magnificently wealthy and that spilled over into the city. It was, it was uh, according to some, uh, Sardis was at one time one of the greatest cities in Asia, one of the most magnificent cities. It was built on a northern slope of Mount Timolus, 
uh, and, it, and you can see on that picture on the left that where that was built, it made this city practically or nearly impregnable. And as a matter of fact, the people who lived there, including the king, the armies, they all believed that there was no way to defeat them because of how they were situated on the side of this mountain. And so one of the side of the mountains apparently was at the time, I, I don't know about now, but at the time was a basically a sheer cliff of rocks. It was attacked time and time and time again, but armies could not defeat them until 546 BC when Cyrus, king of Persia, came against them. And as they laid siege to the city, they were having difficulty, of course, uh, reaching the top. And one night, uh, a, a uh, Persian soldier uh, happened to see a... Um, a, Sardi, a, Sar, a Sar, Sardian, I'm trying to remember how to pronounce that right, a Sardian, not a Sardine, a Sardian. Hey, you come up here and try to do this. It's not that easy, okay? A Sardian a soldier dropped his helmet down the side of this mountain, and, and this Persian soldier uh, watched him climb down uh, there was a, apparently a path in the rocks where they could climb down one by one. It was only big enough for one person to climb down. So this Persian soldier relayed the information uh, to his, uh, his uh, commanders. And one by one, the Persian army climbed up this mountain and reached a gate that was unattended. It was unattended because they felt so secure that there was no need to guard this gate and the, that's how the Persians defeated them in 546. And then again in 214, Antiochus did the exact same thing. They found the exact same way into the city. The city made the exact same mistake of not guarding. As a matter of fact, I read in one commentator who said that it was said that a child could defend that gate because of the way it was situated on the side of this mountain. And yet they left it unguarded. And therefore, uh, the enemy crept in and uh, overtook the city. Now, that's going to play an important role in what we're going to see in Sard Sardis. So, much like the Air Force Base and the two little towns where I grew up, their greatness uh, is in the past. So was the city of Sardis. Its greatness was seen in its past because it had become a dead city. Not that it was completely devoid of life, but its greatness was gone. It was a third-rate city, uh, not that important any longer. So by the time the Romans came and took control, uh, it was, there was no glory left in the city. And as William Ramsey said about the city, no city in Asia at that time showed such a melancholy contrast between past splendor and present decay as Sardis. They were known, even in that day, for their luxury garments industry. Again, this is something that's going to play a key role in understanding what Jesus is saying to the church. Uh, there was a great deal of Caesar worship here. There was also a temple, a large temple to the goddess Sibyl, also known as Artemis. Um, and, but the ancient... Uh, um, the focus of their worship was on the fact that their gods could raise the dead to life. Okay? So um, that also is going to play a role in what we see here. One thing I wanted to make sure we noted, and as you can see, I made that notation there. Ancient cities many times, I don't know if they all did, but we know that Sardis was one that did, had citizenship roles for those who were in good standing but their names could be erased from the rolls for different reasons. Another thing that's going to play an important role in what we see in Sardis. All right, so we're going to look at the character of the author and the condemnation of the church together because they both occur in verse 1 of chapter 3. And here's what it says. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, the one having the seven spirits of God and the seven stars says this, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive or that you live, yet Dead you are. That's my translation. Now you say, well, that sounds funny. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll know why by the time we're done. So 
as we know, when Jesus introduces himself to these churches, he does so in a, in a manner that expresses something about himself that will be important to the life of that church. All right, so here he says, he reiterates that he is the one who has the seven spirits of God. That word has, it means to have in his possession and to have under his control. And so uh, the, the Lord Jesus Christ here is, is reminding them that if there is spiritual life in this church, it's because he sent the spirit to give it life. But if there's spiritual deadness, as in the city of Sardis, that is taking place in this church... It's because the spirit has either been removed or it's been so quenched that there's no spiritual life there. And so he's reminding, him, reminding them that he is the one having the spirit. He is the one in control of the spirit of God. Now, the seven spirits, if you remember, uh, that comes back from Zechariah. And uh, we should get into that at some point. Um, but in well, we might as well go ahead and do it now. If you want to turn over there to Zechariah. In Zechariah chapter 4. In Zechariah chapter 4, um, the angel is speaking to uh, Zechariah. He asked Zechariah, what do you see? He said, I, I, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl on the top of it, with its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on the top of it and two olive trees by it one on the right uh, side of the bowl and the other on its left side then you drop down to verse 10 and, and it says this for who has despised that's oh and of course I got the wrong passage it's yeah no it is verse 10 who has despised the day of small things but these seven, notice that, but these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. So later John is going to equate this same picture with the Spirit of God. So these seven spirits are simply a way of saying uh, the Spirit of God in all of His fullness, in all of His ministries, in His, uh, uh, in his omniscience that would play a big part in this passage since the Lord Jesus sees their deadness. Alright? So he says the one having the spirit, seven spirits of God and the seven stars. We remember the seven stars are what? Well, let's go back to chapter 1. He says, uh, the, the, as for the mystery, verse 20, as for the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So that's where we get our picture here. Here's the seven lampstands, and the, the stars are the ministers, or the elders, pastors, however you want to view that, of these churches. So not only does he have possession of the, of the Spirit of God, he's in control of the Spirit of God, but he's in control of these messengers regardless of their spiritual condition. He goes on and said, I know your deeds. All right, so what is he talking about here? Is he talking about past deeds, works, or present deeds? Well, he's talking about their present situation. And he's looking at the deeds that they do now. And... and that word that, that you see underlined there, it is going to explain the content of these deeds. Now, it seems a little weird to us because you wouldn't think of the content of deeds as that you have a name, that you live, but that's what he's saying here. So he says, the content of your deeds is that you have a name. What does he mean by name? He's talking about their reputation in the city of Sardis. Uh, they have a reputation there, and that reputation is that you live. In other words, they had a reputation in the city of Sardis that they were a living church that followed the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says, yet you, or, or dead you are. And it was, it's phrased that way in the Greek for emphasis. You have a name that you live, yet dead you are. It's an emphatic statement. He's making this contrast that although the city around you for some reason believes that you're a living church, you are in fact spiritually dead. 
All right? So why are they spiritually dead? He doesn't tell us. Sardis is the church where there is no false doctrine mentioned. There is no uh, Jezebel type uh, entity mentioned. Uh, there's, there's no uh, uh, loss of love. There's no sound doctrine. None of that is mentioned. Jesus just goes straight to the boy and says, you're dead. The people, for some reason in the city, think that you're alive, but you're dead. Why is that? Well, speculation, but it could very well be that they had made peace with the culture around them to the point that they were just like the people in the city. And so they reflected the spiritual deadness of the, of the, of the surrounding uh, uh, population. Now, we're always trying to go back and compare today's church to what's going, what, what, what we're finding here in the book of Revelation. And, and it doesn't take much searching to find how many churches and how many pastors and how many denominations have made such peace with the world that they've become just like the world. So the, the world looks at them and says, oh, that's a church. But yet on the inside of that church, there is spiritual deadness. And that's something that as we see, Jesus tells them, he would say the same to us. We have to guard against that. As Cornerstone Bible Church, we are just as susceptible to doing that type of thing as anyone else is. We're all human and we can fall into that same pattern. So this church on the outside, somehow to the people around them, they seem to be alive, but through the piercing eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the work of the Holy Spirit, his omniscience, he knows the hearts of them that they are spiritually dead. What do we mean by spiritually dead then? Does it mean that he's speaking to a group of lost people or is he speaking to a church that has gone spiritually lethargic and has fallen asleep spiritually? And I think we have to go with the second choice. I don't think he's speaking to a group of people who are, as Dr. Couch once put it, professors but not possessors. I believe these are believers who have simply become so comfortable in their surroundings they've become just like their surroundings. Have you ever, how many of you have seen the uh, um, Pirates of the Caribbean movies? You ever seen those movies? What are you people going to movies? Don't you know that's a sin? Anyway, and I think it's the second one. I don't know. There's eight, 28 of them. I don't know. There's, it's either second or third one where um, the father of, and now I'm forgetting everybody's name except for Jack Sparrow, but he's not the one. Uh, the father of uh, Jack's right-hand man basically uh, has been captured by Davy Jones and has become, literally become part of the ship. In other words, he's, he's melded into the ship, right? And so uh, he's in, this, uh, in, 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 in the prison in the bottom of the ship, and, and there's another man who had become so melded to the ship that uh, uh, he became a lamp. So there was a fire burn in his head, but he wakes up and he comes out and starts talking. It was really weird. Um, but anyway, that's kind of like what this church is. They're kind of like have melded with the, the population around them so much that although on the outside to everyone else they seem alive, Jesus says they are spiritually dead. They're lethargic. They're asleep. Now, why do I say that I believe they're believers? Well, why would Jesus tell a bunch of lost peop people to wake up and start guarding the things that are about to die? He would be calling upon them to receive salvation. Um, anyway, moving along then. So what is the correction of the church? Well, we see that in verses 2 through 4. First of all, verse 2, Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die, for I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. All right, so in his correction of the church here, he uses five imperatives. Here are five things that you have to do as a church if you're going to escape my coming upon you as a thief in the night. Okay? He says, first of all, wake up. So there are two words here. There's one, the, the first word is become, and the second word is awake. 
So he's telling them become, and the word awake is a participle. So he's saying become one who is awake or is on watch. Okay. Uh, I was talking to Ron the other day about uh, uh, how he handled being on watch at night. And he said, well, you know, you're not supposed to fall asleep, but, you know, you learn to sleep standing up sometimes. So he said he would, and I hope I'm not getting his, uh, getting him in trouble with the Marines. But anyway, it's his fault. He shouldn't have told me. Um, and so he said he'd be standing there and his, his, uh, his uh, commander would come at, Hillis, are you awake? Just praying, sir. You know. So anyway. As a watch, as a person on watch, Ron or any other military person who's on watch must stay awake, must be watchful, must be, must be looking out for the enemy, right? And that's what he's telling him. Wake up. You've grown lethargic. You've fallen asleep as a church, and you're like one that is spiritually dead. But not only that, to become watchful, but they have to strengthen, which means to make firm uh, the spiritual things that are about to die. Now, the question is, are, strengthen what? Are we strengthening people or are we strengthening something else? Uh, I don't think he's talking about strengthening people. I mean, that doesn't, doesn't fit the context, doesn't seem to make much sense. What he's talking about are those spiritual things that they still had that Jesus says they're about to die also. They're about to be gone you need to wake up, become watchful, and then you also need to strengthen or to shore them up. And he gives the reason. Why is it? Why is it they have to wake up and strengthen these things? He says, because. You can, you can, sometimes when you see that word for, you can put that word because. And that's what we can do here. I have not found your deeds completed. All right, here is that Greek word plerao. We've talked about that many times. It means to be filled up. It means to be perfect. It means to be complete. So what does he mean here? Is he, is he saying that they still have work to do? Or is he saying something else? Well, I think the, the idea of having work left to do is obviously in the picture but I, as well as other uh, commentators that I read, uh, believe that what he's saying here is that the works that you have done or that you are doing, they're not, they're not uh, measuring up to the, um, uh, to the standards of God. So that's why he says, these works, these deeds have not been completed in the sight of my God. In other words, God looks at the deeds that you are doing and they don't meet his standard. So some have speculated. Uh, Dr. Couch said that he believes that they were doing it half-heartedly. Uh, others said that they did these deeds without any love. And there are a, a myriad of, of ways of looking at it. Whatever it is, how they were doing these, their works, in God's sight, they were lacking in value, in quality. So that's, that uh, word, uh, this is the perfect tense of the word. It can sometimes speak of something being done unsatisfactorily. So it's speaking qualitatively, not quantitatively. So instead of like filling up a glass with Coke or something, it's saying that what you have put in that glass has soured. It's not good in the eyes of God. So they are to wake up. They are to strengthen those spiritual things that were about to die so that they could, could, could continue doing works, but in a way that pleased God or met his standards. So verse 3 then, so remember, okay? So he's calling upon them to look back and, and get hold of some memory. What is it? He says, uh, uh, one way to look at it is, is to give earnest attention to something. And he says, in your New American Standard, I'm not sure what the others say, I didn't look, but in New American says, says it says, remember what you have received. But that word, that Greek word used there, its basic meaning is remember how you have received and how you have heard. Well, let's just look at this for just a moment. When you first heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and you became convicted of your sin... And you believed that message. How did you do that? Did you do it like, uh, 
okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I'm, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner dying and going to hell, but Jesus provided my salvation. I'll, uh, okay, I'll, I'll buy that. Is that how you did it? Because I remember like yesterday when I was seven years old, I remember how I did it. I did it down on my knees weeping over my sin, thanking God that he saved me. I did it with enthusiasm. I did it with open arms. I did it with a welcome attitude and with gratefulness. And as a matter of fact, I even uh, sitting in the, the back little cubby hole of my brother's Volkswagen v, uh, VW back then, uh, telling my brothers, you know, I, I've just been saved. And then they, of course, as big brothers do, poured cold water all over. But anyway, regardless, I'm sure they'll answer for that before God. Um, but... Uh, you received it. How did you receive? You received it with gladness, mixed with the the uh, the the, the uh, regret for your own sin. But you received it with gladness, and that's what he's telling. You. Remember the enthusiasm, the zeal with which you received what you heard, and then he says, and then keep it, keep on giving earnest attention to the need to strengthen. That leftover vitality, that spiritual vitality that you once had. There's a little bit there that's left. Wake up, strengthen it, remember, and keep it. And then also, of course, repent. In other words, to turn your mind from this spiritual lethargy that you've been experiencing and regain that zeal, that joy. Uh, when I read this, it reminds me of, uh, I think it was David. Um, and I'm probably wrong. But anyway, who says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. That's, what, that's a picture I get when I read these words. Well, then, of course, he says, therefore, in other words, regarding everything I just said, if you decide not to obey what I'm saying, if you do not wake up, he says, I will come like a thief. And you will by no means know at what hour I will come upon or come against you. Now you say, well, why have you changed these words? Well, because that's what the Greek literally means. Not that the New American Standard has done a bad job. It's just that I believe... Uh, this really presents to us a little bit clearer what he is saying here. Because that by no means is, is a, a double negative in Greek. It is the strongest negation that there is in Greek. It's ume. It's no not. Okay? Well, that didn't make any sense to us. What he's saying here, here is that there is by no means any chance at all that you will know when I am coming upon you. So he says, I'm going to come like a thief. This language is typically reserved for the second coming of Christ. And I see no reason really to try to make it mean anything else here. Now, how does that work with that church in that day? How is the second coming of Christ going to uh, cause that church uh, to, to wake up and, and sit upright? I, I, well, probably because of the, the wording he uses here. The thief in the night, you don't know when he's coming. So you better wake up now and do the things that he says. Because when he does come in judgment, no one's going to know when. Now this is speaking of judgment. This is speaking of future judgment in the tribulation, right? But we also don't know when the rapture is going to occur, right? So we have to run back over then to 1 John. And in 1 John, in chapter 2, verse 28, John says, Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink away from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And I'm going to skip down to verse 3 in, in chapter 3. Um, I hate to skip those two verses, but anyway. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. So, 
We don't know when the Lord Jesus is going to come call his church home. So John warns us, hey, uh, we need to live in such a manner that when he does call us home, we do not shrink away from him. We aren't ashamed because we're not living like we should. Because you remember, the, uh, um, we could look at Paul's life, right? Paul on the road to Damascus, the Lord Jesus appears to him in all his glory, so bright that it blinds him. And what happens to Paul? He falls on his face on the ground, right? Who are, who are you, Lord? Uh, hey, I, I give up, right? You can see the same in Isaiah. Oh, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. You can see it all throughout Scripture. You can see it in Revelation chapter 1 where, G, where, where John sees Jesus and he falls down. Uh, or at least in Daniel. Uh, am I misremembering something? Um, regardless. All, all these pictures of when people come in, in face-to-face contact with the holiness of God and the reaction's always the same. They collapse. Well, when Jesus calls us home, according to John, I'm thinking that there's a really good chance that if I'm not living like I should, I am going to be utterly terrified. And so Jesus is telling them the same thing here. I'm going to come upon you. Now that word um, in, um, in my New American Standards, he says, I will come to you. Well, again, it's, the, it's a preposition in the Greek that normally it's, its basic meaning is to, to come upon something. Um, or sometimes to come against something. So what kind of picture is this stirring up in the mind of these uh, uh, believers in Sardis? It's stirring up in them that picture of how Sardis was was defeated twice by people sneaking up on them when they weren't expecting it and, and overcoming them, coming upon them, coming against them. And so he's telling this church in Sardis the same thing. Hey, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to come against you and there's no way you're going to know when that's going to take place. So then in verse 4 he says this, But you have a few names in Sardis who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And you say, well, where in the world did you get that names at? Well, from the Greek. It, I don't know why they said people in my New American Standard, because the word here is names. You have a few names there who have not soiled their garments. So this tells us then that Jesus knows his sheep by name. In John 10:3. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Jesus knows us by name. That should be something that gives us courage and encouragement. What does he mean by soil their garments? Well, you remember what James 1.27, this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. It's the same picture here. Those white garments and the word stain here means literally to smear something on. So it's like, you know, you, you're changing the oil in your car, you know, and you get oil on your hands and you take your rag and you smear the oil onto the rag off of your hand, right? Or if, you know, if you're really uncouth, you just do it on your, you know, kind of like when you're eating and you just what, you know, that kind of thing. Anyway, so these people haven't smeared the soil of the world upon themselves. In, in James 4.4, 4, he says, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's what we see in this church in Sardis. They have become comfortable in the world. They become enemies of God. They have soiled their garments, but there were some names, some people there, who had not. And he says, they're going to walk with me. What, they're going to be in close fellowship with me in white, in this beautiful white garment. Why? Because they are worthy. Now, he's not saying they in themselves are worthy. We know that. But because of their relationship with him, they are worthy. So he's talking about the fellowship with Christ in his kingdom. So finally, there's the challenge to the church. He who overcomes will in this same manner be clothed in white garments. And I will by no means erase his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Okay? 
White meaning purity. White always refers to purity in scripture as far as I can tell. He says again, there's that double negative. I will by no means erase his name. Well, how do we get to that point? Well, first of all, we got to go back. He overcomes in this same manner. What does he mean by that? That's a very literal translation. In this same manner, in other words, uh, just like those who have not, uh, those names who have not soiled their garments, those who overcome in the same manner are going to be wearing these white garments, the white garments of purity. And he says, I will by no means erase his name from the book of life. This is speaking of the preservation of the saints. Not the perseverance of the saints, but the preservation of the saints. Now, turn over with me, if you will, to Revelation 13 real quick. Revelation 13, 8. All who dwell on the earth will worship the beast. Everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Well, there are two ways this can be uh, uh, understood. One is, to, is that the book has been written from the foundation of the world. The other is that the Lamb has been slain from the foundation of the world. Well, in Revelation 21, 27, well, I don't want to go there yet. Um, so how does it mean? Well, both translations or both ways of understanding the verse come to the same conclusion. Both this lamb has been, the lamb has been slain from the foundation of the world, Jesus Christ. It's the plan of God. But the book of life has been written from the foundation of the world. And this takes us back to what we talked about early in the introduction. The many ancient cities of that day would have a membership role in that city uh, of citizens. But those citizens could have their names erased if they did something out of line. One of the ways to do something out of line would be to try to approach one of their pagan gods in dirty clothing, stained clothing. And if that was the case, they would be shunned and their names would be erased from the citizenship rolls. So is Jesus saying that there's a chance of us losing our salvation? Not at all. What he's saying is that those who die without having put their faith in Jesus Christ, their names will be erased from the, the book of life. But those of us who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, we're going to walk with him in white, in close fellowship, and there's no way our names will ever be erased from the book of life. Not only that, he goes on and says, I will also confess or say the same thing before God the Father and his angels. And he's saying, I'm going to stand up and say, these are mine. These are worthy to walk with me in these white garments. It's a special reward. You ever seen one of those old movies, period movies? There's my favorite movies are period movies. I don't know why, but when, like back in the, you know, uh, when they had Knights of the Round Table and all that type of stuff, right? What happens when, when someone is come, comes in before the king? What do they do? They announce his name to the king. Uh, here's, uh, you know, Prince who done it or who cares about him, whatever. And so they announce his name. Before the king. And this is the same picture we get here. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to present us before God the Father and before his angels. It's going to be an amazing thing, I think. And finally, of course, he ends the same way as always. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All right. So what is the character of Christ? He is the controller of the Spirit and the churches. The condemnation is that this church is dead. Spiritually lethargic. And the correction is that they must wake up. And there are four other um, imperatives with that, but that's the main one. And then the challenge is, as always, hear the Spirit's message to the churches. Now, some of you may question, uh, how is this church alive but yet spiritually dead? And here's how I think it works. In uh, Romans chapter 6. And I thought I had the passage here, but I don't. So I'm going to have to turn back here. Romans chapter 6, 
Verse 15, what then shall we, uh, well, let me, no, let's we'll start there. 15, what, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of, diso of, or, or of obedience resulting in righteousness? Then in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life. Christ Jesus our Lord. Now we use these passages as salvation passages, which I think is appropriate, but he's speaking to believers and he's saying, look, if you're a believer and you present your body as an instrument of sin, then what you're doing is you're going back to that old life. You're entering back into that dead way of life and the sin in you results in death in you, not spiritual death as in separation from God uh, as in loss of salvation or something like that but it's spiritual death in that you're separated from fellowship with God and you're living like that dead old man and so this church in Sardis had basically given up on all that it seems that it's likely that they had made such peace with the world around them that they simply became like the world and Jesus is trying to wake them up and so we need to look at ourselves it says, does, does this church in Sardis reflect me? Or am I more like ready to be like Smyrna or Philadelphia? Father, we thank you for your word and pray that we've handled it correctly this morning. Lord, I pray that you would help us Father, to be holy and righteous people who reflect the glory of God in our lives, who reflect the work of the Spirit in our lives, and who reflect the grace that we have received through you, Lord Jesus Christ, in your death, burial, and resurrection, the fact that you called us to yourself and you wiped the scales from our eyes to be able to see the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, that as we leave this place, we will glorify you by living holy and righteous lives, living out who we are in Christ. Help us to grow to that end. Father, help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please stand?